Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca, home of New York's craft cider. I love New York. Plan your getaway at visitithaca.com. Bienvenidos. Welcome to another episode of Cooking in Mexico from A to Z on Heritage Radio Network. We're really excited. I'm Aaron Sanchez, alongside my beautiful mother. Sarela Martinez. And we are very, very over the moon, muy, uh, muy entusmados, porque we have a really awesome, awesome guest here that's going to be talking about butchery, Mexican butchery in specific, and how to fabricate all the different cuts that um, are, so, are, are so special to all different kinds of dishes throughout Mexico. Of course, uh, our guest today is Mauricio Ureste. I hope I said that properly. Um, he is also the brand developer and marketing of his own company. Uh, basically, Mauricio has been in the culinary industry for over 25 years. Meat is definitely his passion. Um, you know, he's, he has this beautiful sort of um, business to help and guide different corporations and companies around the world uh, in the US, U.S. Hispanic market and Latin America about how to work with unbelievable meat and its unique, trendy culinary experiences at, for global markets. Uh, and he's recognized as one of the greatest chefs in doing this. And this is really exciting because I think this is a subject matter that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, they don't understand the different cuts and the varieties and the distinctive ways that meat is butchered in Mexico, especially. So we're really excited to have Mauricio joining us. Uh, bienvenido, querido. Thank you for being here. Well, you know, it, this, this was the hardest of all guests to find. Because mm -hmm. this has been, uh, I've been trying to find a specialist in this, in this field for, since we started, actually. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's not just me. Rick Bayless, too, is, I said, you know, I think I found somebody. And, and he said, oh, well, you have to give me his name because it's, it, it's, it's a specialty that very few people have. So we are honored and thrilled to have you here joining us today. Thanks a lot, you know, for your invitation. And uh, hopefully we could do a very good uh, seminar talking about uh, Mexican beef. You know, my expertise I've been learning for, from all over the world with uh, different chefs and different, uh, uh, I would say it's a huge difference between food service and retail market of beef. So we need to understand, first of all, that all the beef and breeds come originally from Europe. I mean, the main breeds, which uh, would be Angus, for example, or Hereford or all the breeds. So all the, all the main breeds that we use in America, from Canada to Argentina, they may only come from Europe. Well, mm. we, in our cattle ranch, we had Carablancas de, de Chihuahua. You know, we had Hereford, Hereford cattle, and, and they're, uh, they're called Carablanca because they have a white face. Exactly. And we're still doing it in Chihuahua in Mexico. Actually, Chihuahua and Sonora, that are the main cattle lands in Mexico. In Mexico, Chihuahua and Sonora, they export cattle to the States. And they also export beef or processed beef to all over the world, including Japan, China, Russia, you know, different countries. Mauricio, and I love that real quick, just so everyone's clear with their listening, I want you to continue. But the majority of beef that's consumed in, 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 the, in the new world 
or in, in the Americas is European varieties. I love that. Please continue. Exactly. Exactly. So we call Bostaurus. Mm -hmm. Genetically, the original name of those breeds is Bostaurus. So we have the other DNA breeds, which comes from, from Asia. They are called Bos Indicus. So all those Bos Indicus is uh, the ones with the, with the hip and the ones uh, that they really don't marble the beef, you know. Those cattle are used to do the hard work, uh, and uh, they are not really tender beef at all. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, it's a beef that is still being produced in Mexico in some areas, especially south and southeast, because of the weather. So the weather is really making a huge difference when you're producing a high graded beef or low marble beef. Yeah, like Cebus. Oh. Yeah, you're so talking you, about Cebus? Exactly. Ce, Cebus is called Bos Indicus, the DNA from for those cattle, and they come from Asia, from India. Mm. So that's that's the main difference. The rest of the, of, the, of the animals mainly come from Ireland, from France, you know, from Central Europe. Is the one that that we still use at some point with the bullfighters, you know, mm. that the real Bostaurus, when they the rest of the of the animals really come from, you know, that's the original DNA. Yeah, Taurus. So it makes a huge difference. Taurus is bull. Exactly. So in Mexico, we have, as you know, different uh, weathers and different areas. So in the north, we have a really cold weather in, the, in Chihuahua and Sonora. That's why it's Chihuahua and Sonora, they are able to produce European DNA cattle. Just as Cana Blanca, as you mentioned, Sarela. And, Angus. Uh, uh, Angus, for example, Cimental, Limousine, all those breeds. Charolais. That come from Europe. Charolais, uh -huh. And the, in the other hand, you know, the South and South uh, East, they produce the Bos Indicus. You mm. know, Cebu and Cebuinos, they are being produced in Tabasco, they are being produced, you know, in different areas in Mexico because of the weather. Mm. The, the warmer the weather is, you know, the less marbling the animals are. So what do, what do they use for the yuntas? Let's explain what that yuntas is, mommy. Okay, come on. Come on. They use them in the fields, you know, to, to, to make the, to make the, how do, you, how do you explain it, Mauricio? In the ground. Yeah. Like, in the ground. They use it in the grounds to do, to help, you know, Make the, burrows, the make the furrows, make the furrows in the fields. Exactly. exactly. So they use a buino, they use a boost, you know, to do so. To do the work. So mm -hmm. they are the hard, the hard workers animals. That's interesting to mention with colder weather, it, they're, they're going to be more inclined to put on more fat, more weight, so that you can start to marble, right? If it's hotter, if you travel through Southeast Asia, you kind of see these little skinny cows running around. <laughs> and that's because it, it's hot, right? <laughs> they're not skinny cows, exactly. but they're... You know what I mean? They don't have that beef and that sort of aesthetic that everyone is expects when they see cattle. <laughs> and, and you know, like that. You're the, right. <laughs> the, the herpers are very are very hardy, because if you have a drought, which you have often in the in the north, they will even eat the mesquite, uh, le you know, leaves to to survive. You know, not, and and they dried grass clumps or whatever, but they make it. They're hardy. Exactly. They're very hardy cattle. So what do you think is the main difference between Mexican butchery and American butchery? Well, I think it's the cuts that we use, you know, because in Mexico we use definitely the entire carcass. You know, we use everything. In the States or Canada, for example, they don't need a tongue. You know, a beef tongue, for example, in Canada or some, part, some uh, areas in the States, you don't need it, you know. Mm -hmm. And for in Mexico or Asia, for example, in China or Japan, they eat, you know, the tongue. Mm -hmm. One of the best uh, dishes in Mexico is the beef tongue, you know. Of course. The barbacoa made, made of beef tongues or the head meat. I love that. Exactly. It tastes delicious, you know. I've been in some of, uh, of Mexican restaurants, for example, in Vancouver, 
one of uh, my friends, uh, Yair Tejes, opened a restaurant there in Vancouver, and he was offering big tongs. But nobody knew what about big tongue, you know? Mm. So they were not even able to try it. So I, I, I was, you know, talking once I visited the restaurant there in Vancouver, and I was telling the guests, try it, you know? Once you try it, you will see that it's mm-hmm. a spectacular, the flavor, the tenderness that the beef tongues could provide. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid, you know, of uh, listen, it's a beef tongue or it's a beef uh, meat head or whichever. You need to try it first. You need to see a difference between one cup and the other. Some of them, they provide a really good fat. For example, in Monterey, uh, we use the beef lips for barbacoa. Mm, so the, lips. The, yeah. fat, the fat on the lips is spectacular, you know, the flavor that it, that it provides. You know what I love are taco, ta- oh, cheeks. Cheeks, beef cheeks as well, you know, we use it at barbacoa. But for example, Sarela, even in Mexico, you know, if you go north, like in Monterey, they, in every, uh, I would say in every store on Sundays, they offer beef leaves, you know, mm-hmm. for barbacoa. <laughs> but if yeah. you go to Mexico City and you you try to find a beef lips for barbacoa, you won't find it. They have never tried, you know. I've been talking with different chefs in Mexico. And why don't you try the beef lips for you doing your barbacoa? I said, well, I've never tried it. Why? You know? I just got the Mauricio, story. no, no. Let me tell you, it's hard to find a good pair of lips. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> to find a good pair of lips, man. Oh, man, we struggle. Forget Sundays. <laughs> but you know, you, you, you know, you know that, that tongue has become very popular because of the taco trucks. You know, yeah, in here, exactly. New, in here in New York, everybody has, yeah, the food trucks have a, have tongue. And my, my mom used to make it in Pipian. Yeah, in Pipian, yeah. In, yeah. Remember, well, you, you are a good friend of Ricardo Muñoz. Ricardo Muñoz is doing the best pipián that I've ever tried, you know. Mm-hmm. And he, he has been using different cuts for pipián. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end, that is makes, makes a huge difference in the beef market, you know, because you can sell, for example, the tribes, you know, mm-hmm. in different areas in Mexico, which that cut is not being used mm-hmm. anywhere else except Asia, in Latin America. Mm-hmm. So the tribes, which uh, you have tried the menudo. Of course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important that we make a distinction here because I think so we're just clear that the idea of that, one of the biggest differences, I think, between American butchery, we're used to having in America big cuts of steaks, right? These, these, exactly. these monsters, these 12, 16 ounce steaks, you know, whether they're New York's, whether the ribeyes, T-bones, et cetera, et cetera. But in Mexico, everything is cut very thinly and kind of fabricated in a very different way, depending on the recipe. Correct, Mauricio? Correct. And you know why? You know why? Because 40 years ago, for example, uh, you were not able even to find, you know, a marble beef in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And people didn't know. So everything was about... About the Bisteco Milanesa, you know, very thin mm-hmm. uh, steaks coming from uh, inside round mm-hmm. or gooseneck, uh, which we call in Spanish pulpa negra or pulpa blanca. Mm-hmm. So all very thin beef cuts, they were uh, made to produce milanesas or cortadillo, all those Mexican dishes. Because no. in the south and central part of Mexico, the cattle, they, they don't marble, you know? Yeah, as you said. So they are most, mostly coming from Bosindicus, only yeah. in the north. And they don't age. Exactly. That's why pe- in the mindset of people in Mexico said the best beef in Mexico comes from north. Yeah, it comes from north because it marbles, because yeah. of the weather, because yes. of the breed, okay? So exactly. we, we need to understand that our country, Mexico, it has a huge difference in weathers, you know, in, in terrain, they have mountains, in terrain, yeah. you know. So it's all, all right. about land, you yeah. know. Not only, not only for beef, for any product, right? Yeah, exactly. For any product, it's all about land. It's all about weather. Terror. So that's the first thing in terror, exactly. The taste and terror. So you need to 
to understand that, first of all, when you try to get the ingredients. So mm. that is, is making a huge difference. You know? and, and also the, the, the meat is not aged in Mexico in general. And now they are aging, you know. But 30 mm -hmm. years ago, of course, they were not. You know? Exactly. The first companies in Mexico which started importing beef from the States or Canada or Japan, they were established 30 years ago, no longer than that. Okay. Gotcha. And it's, uh, it were all about the NAFTA, you know? Yep. With the NAFTA, we got like uh, exchange, you know, with products uh, from Mexico going to Canada and the States, products from Canada and the States coming to Mexico. So it helped a lot, you know, yeah. to make a really good exchange of different products. Mm. Nowadays, as I was telling you, you can find in the States U.S. beef made with Mexican cattle raised in Chihuahua and Sonora. Or you can find Canadian beef with uh, cattle raised in the States, you know. Or you can find... So you can... It's, it's a... It's an exchange, you know, on all the attributes from each land. Is that the role which makes a difference? Now, do we have, in, in Mexico, there is an equivalent to the USDA, correct? So before beef gets to come into the, across the border, there needs to be an inspection and there needs to be a certification. Is that correct? Uh, correct. In Mexico, yeah. we, we have no grades for the beef. Yeah. We start doing it nowadays with the Mexican beef producers. But in Canada, they use the prime, triple A, double A, and A. In the States, they use prime, choice, uh, select, or a standard mm -hmm. normal beef. In Mexico, we don't have that grades for now. Because the wow. only land who could be using those grades uh, would be Sonora and Chihuahua and maybe some other small regions in the north gotcha. because of the weather. You keep on mentioning milanesas. I think we have to define that. That is like a breaded cutlet, like a breaded veal cutlet, but made with beef, very, very thinly sliced. And they make the best tortas that ever. Oh, yes. You make yes. sandwiches. It's, uh, made, it's made with inside rounds, uh -huh. mm -hmm. which we call pul pulpa negras yeah. in mm -hmm. uh, in Spanish, and those pulpa negras or pulpa blancas, which is the gooseneck, so they got it really thin uh, steaks to do the milanesas or to mm. do the bistec. That mm. is called bistec. Yep. So bistec, B I S T E C. Do you know mochomos? Well, yeah, I know I know mochomos. Most of the of the cuts they're coming from in Mexico. We use a lot of uh, uh, peel knuckle as well. Peel mm. knuckle in Spanish is pulpa bola. Uh -huh. mm. so, so that is that is called the piña. The piña is part of the leg. So the three different muscles that we have over in the leg is the inside round, is the peel knuckle, and is the gooseneck. So which is pulpa blanca, pulpa bola, and pulpa negra. So all wow. of the main dishes in Mexico. Which is the osobuco? Oh uh, well, the osobuco is the osobuco is coming from the leg, you know. From the chambarete, no? Or those further exactly. down, right? From okay. the from the legs. Yeah. Yeah. And and another um, another well known dish comes from uh, from the roast meat. So the roast mm. meat is called suadero. I've tried yep. the suadero, right? Mm -hmm. So they are really well known tacos. Tell, tell me what it is again. Please describe it to me, suadero. Suadero, the roast meat, it's come from the uh, part of the, uh, of the stomach, you know? Yeah, they are the muscles. It's like inside uh, inside skirt and outside skirt. Mm. So inside skirt is the, uh, the arrachera. The yeah, common arrachera that we know, it comes from the muscles that are in the stomach of the cattle. Is that the skirt steak? Yes, mommy. Yeah, the skirt steak. Arrachera, mommy. Yeah. Yeah. Arrachera. And we know the entraña. You know the entraña, which is really well known 
from Argentina, Uruguay, and in Mexico we use it as well. It is the outside the skirt. So it's part of the skirt in the animal, and it's a muscle that comes uh, in the inside out of the stomach wow. area. Wow. And then, but this is interesting because it's called suavero, right? So the idea that this cut is named after a dish, no, or, or style of taco, no, or is it, how how does how does it become that name is the question, right? So suavero is a style of taco. Well, we, 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 we need we need to ask Ricardo Muñoz, you know, about the name. I know. How <laughs> exactly. <it's so. laughs> well, so maybe we need to do our research. Well, yeah, it's a yeah. question that, that we we need to to answer, you know, and find That's out. That's interesting. The name for the suavero. It's an interesting question. And how about the brisket? How's the brisket? What is the cut of the... The brisket is el pecho, so mm -hmm. in the chest. Yeah. And in the brisket is mostly used in the north part of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's a winter cut, you know, because it's a slow cook. Yep. Cut because it's kind of hard. So it takes time to get a, a good brisket, you know, in the oven. Mm -hmm. So... These are uh, mostly used in the winter time in the states. I would say south of the states in Mexico. Yeah, exactly. That's interesting because now we're talking about all these different cuts and how they're used, right? And I think for me, I, I find fascinating is the idea that some of these different cuts are used for specific dishes in Mexico, and that's how you name them, right? So he had just spoken to, right? And, and for example, the 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 most tender, you know, cuts in a carcass are the ones that they are not really, the animal is not really using at all. Of course, in the back. Okay. Yeah. So in the back, the loins. So the tender loin, strip loin, ribeyes, you know. I think that's something, I think it's important to mention. You're right. That's why with the animals not using a lot of stress, it, it's actually the softer part. I think a lot of people don't even know that. And I think that's very important to mention. I appreciate that, you know? And, um, and we need to mention that the grates, the ribeye is the one that provides the grates in the animal. Mm. So in the slaughter plants or harvest plants, they cut, you know, the carcass between 11 and 12 ribs and they expose the, the eye of the ribeye, okay? So they use yes. an infrared camera to check out the marbling. Once you check out the marbling wow. with an infrared camera, it provides you the grade for the carcass. So that carcass would be a prime carcass, would be a choice, or would be a select. So it makes a difference. Even in Canada, it would be AAA, AA, or A, you know, that is the one that provides so the king wow. of the cuts would be the ribeye. So the ribeye is the one that grates the animal or the carcass. What do they call that dish with a, with a big rib, honey? There's, a, you know, the, it's a dish they use the entire rib. Do you know? Is, there's a well, particular well, the, tomahawk. The, the, the tomahawk. Uh -huh. the tomahawk. Yeah. yeah, the tomahawk. Yeah, the, the cut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's a big I steak. I love yeah. that. Yeah, the yeah, tomahawk. Tomahawk, but we have different cuts, you know, made with the tomahawk. We have the scorpion, which yep. is the the ribeye is split in half, and then you have the, the huge bone coming from the rib, and they call it a scorpion cut. There you go. There you go. In, in some other restaurants, they call it mantarraya. Andale, the mantarraya. So, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah like, like the stingray. I love exactly. that. You know, one of the things that I discovered is that the brown meat isn't really used so much in, in, in Mexico, but more finely chopped, no? Like minced meat. Yeah. That comes from the shoulder. You know, the shoulder cloth, it provides the best 80, 20 uh, ground beef. You know, exactly. from the hamburgers, from the meatballs, from any, from, from the stuffed chile, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, chile relleno that we call, uh, is made with... Uh, or picadillo. With shoulder cloth. Picadillo. Exactly, picadillo. So is that what you would call the, the diez millo or no? Or yeah. like the chuck, right? The shoulder, right? The paleta, no? The paleta is the shoulder yeah, cloth. The diezmillo, it, it has part of the, the same muscle. You know? Gotcha. You should it's write a book about this. It's part of the neck. <laughs> you should write a book about this, Marisa. There's a lot of books. Yeah, we, well, I was 
planning to do a, a, a book, you know, with, uh, with Ricardo at some point. But he has been doing a really great uh, book of recipes. He has been discovering over 600 different recipes exclusively using beef wow. in Mexico with different cuts. Wow, wow. So he has been doing a really great job, you know, uh, uh, saying in which area in Mexico they are using, for example, the stomach, which areas they are using the... Uh, the shoulder cloths for ground yeah. beef, which areas they are using their their roast meat and everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, wow, it's amazing. My mic is sitting on, on Ricardo's Gastronomica Mexicana, so I can't I can't move it to look up suadero <laughs> <laughs> because then because then I'll take up get the mic off the line and forget it. It'll be a lot of trouble. But he's he's the one that recommended you. Well, yeah, I know. And he has been one of uh, the teachers that I have been learning with, you know. He's the master of masters in no, Mexico. No, he's amazing. With all the Mexican culinary cuisine, and we are all admiring his I, work, I, you know. I, I shot with Ricardo 20 years ago. I mean, it's un tesoro. He's just an absolute treasure. He's an, And we're so excited. We're going to have him on. And just We're waiting for him to have his schedule open up. You know, it's funny that we talk about these different cuts, just on a side note, I went to England and London to work, and on Sundays they do a roast. Okay, it's a big thing in England. Uh -huh. Have you been, Mauricio? Okay, yeah, I've been once in London. Okay, okay only so a couple they, of days. Yeah. So on Sundays they do this roast where they make the Yorkshire pudding, and they use the rump roast. Okay, so basically it's the culo <laughs> uh, uh, of the pig. I mean of the, of, of the beef, and they get so excited about it, and I'm like, it. You know, it's good. But it, they serve you like a, a little steak of ass, a culo, you know? And they love it. The English, they, they enjoy it. I go, okay. You know, <laughs> the rump roast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even the tail, you know, you have a, you get, uh, you know, really, yeah. Yeah. Like rabo de res. Rabo mestiza is the name of the dish. Mm -hmm. it is, it's a really nice, you know, flavor, you know? Mm -hmm. All the keratin. Yeah. That, it provides is mm -hmm. almost the same as lips, you know, the same character. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes a huge difference on the flavor. I would say so, yeah. <laughs> but you were you right. You gotta you know, go from the, the, the <laughs> tail to the lips, baby. <laughs> well, that's what, it's hand to foot. I'm what is it? Lips same, to foot. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same character, you know, at the end. <laughs> I would say so. I love it. I love it's it. Funny, it's funny, but it's true, you know? <laughs> it's true. You, you were talking about England, and Canada has been influenced by France and England, you know? Mm -hmm. So most of the dishes that they normally use and the beef cuts is the, are the same, you know, that they are being used in France and England as well. I, I was just reading so, an article about the hoof being used for, for something. It's, I think it's a big thing right now, eating the beef hoof. Yeah, the foot. It has all that wonderful gelatin, isn't Don't I, I want to believe that they use it to make, I mean, obviously the gelatin that you get from the foot is used for other things, Mom. Yeah. Like it has this unbelievable amount of gelatin. You know, when, when I was working, uh, you know, with a Canadian company, I used to name one of uh, my friends, uh, Federico Lopez. Who, I know Federico well. well. He's a good man. And, and uh, he used to do a dish with, uh, made with a ribeye. So he was using the fat of the ribeye to do the risotto. Oh, mm. yeah. Well, that's the one that we had at, 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 uh, at, uh, in, what was the name of that restaurant in Mexico City? Where they made the risotto with, with the marrow. Tuetano, and with tuetano. With a tuetano, and, and then the, exactly. uh, oh my God, that was one of my absolute favorite. Was he the chef? No, Federico wasn't, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, Federico is, uh, is uh, from Maya Riviera. Yeah. He's, uh, he's doing catering in Maya Riviera. But uh, I was uh, just mentioning it because he's using uh, even the fat from the ribeye, the center cut, and the spinalis, you know. The spinalis became recently, I would say, the, in the recent uh, years, about uh, five or six years ago, like a trendy cut, you know, for the higher yeah. restaurants. 
the spinalis, what is that? which is the, is the cap of the ribeye. In the ribeye, you have three muscles. You have this, the center cup and you have the cap. So the cap of the ribeye is the spinalis. So mm -hmm. the spinalis in a higher restaurant could cost you like the triple uh, times the cost of, the, of a ribeye. You know? mm -hmm. So Federico was doing the spinalis with the center cup and the risotto made with the same uh, fat mm, uh, of a ribeye. It was, you know, spectacular. Oh, no, he's an amazing chef. Fed, the man. So he was also using the silver skin, which some of the chefs uh, used to drop, the, drop it. The silver skin, he, he used to put it on the oven, and he was doing some kind of, uh, I would say, like, like chicharron. Exactly. Wow. Just, I love that. Uh, just to add flavor to some soups and dishes. Wow. So I find that amazing. At the end, everything is useful, right? Yes. If you know how to cook it and you know how to apply every every muscle of the, of the carcass, even the fat, you know, silver skin, everything has to be used. The thing is you, you need to learn how to use it. Absolutely. You know, when I was about nine or ten years old, he was with Cafe Marie. He was in the, ki in the kitchen with the chef with Tony, and who, Tony, who was from like Qu Queens. And I don't had learned how to take off the, the silver skin, uh, 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 whatever it was, it was pork or something like that. And, and I don't, and Tony was from, from Queens, so he had this real heavy accent, you know. So then I don't just tell me that he had learned, and he said, then you take the cleaver. You know, <laughs> the, cle the cleaver. <laughs> Look, I see, the, I see all the nails. The, the cleaver. They take and the then cleaver. He got some I see, yeah. Yes, mom, thank you. Well, but, that was um, cute. It was cute. I just think, I think it's important to mention too that chefs need to start to get back into the art of butchery. Back to basics. And the basics. And I think, I think it's very yeah. easy for chefs nowadays to order everything already pre cut. Um, everything already, la mano de obra is already done for you. I think it's very important for chefs to get back and order whole cuts of meat and break them down themselves. I think it's extremely important. Exactly. You know, one, one of the problems at the culinary schools that are, are, I've been finding is they, they don't practice enough, you know, the mm -hmm. I'm talking about, about Mexico. I'm not talking about Europe because, yeah. you know, for example, nowadays I'm in Merida working with my culinary dad, I would, I would say so, yeah, which yeah. is Alex, Alex Rudin. Mm -hmm. Alex Rudin is a well-known chef uh, from uh, Maya Riviera. Yeah, I know works in the past for, uh, for Hyatt and different uh, 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 hotels. He opened a new uh, restaurant here in Merida, which is called Sacha's. Mm. So I came just uh, to work with him on the uh, on the working for the meats, you know, with the meats. Mm. And he is doing, for example, lamb hand, which is a, a lamb rack with the mm. five bones exposed like a hand. I will wow. be sharing the pictures of it with you. And he was the first one which uh, I was learning from. Because 20 years ago, he was providing seminars with the beef that we were importing from the States, Canada, or any, any other country. He was the one providing the, the beef seminars to all the rest of the chefs all over the Mayan region. I remember uh, almost 15 years uh, ago that one of the first seminars were provided in Eshkai. So Alex oh, yeah. was the one explaining how to use the carcass, how to do those things. And talking with him, he was telling me, well, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, at the culinary school, they teach you how to do the butchery. It's one of the, wow. the first things that you need to learn before coming a cook, you know? Because if you, if you tell him you are a chef, he said, no, I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, same thing here. I'm a cook, you know? Since, exactly. since you mentioned lamb, I, I, maybe I want to know if you know this dish. At the ranch, they used to take, we used to take the lamb tenderloin and wrap it with the milk tripe, like really tightly, and grill it. And it was called machitos. Yeah. Machitos is a really well-known dish in Monterey. 
Yeah. Well, they, yeah, yeah. They're also they making are, a motare, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would kill for some of that. Right they are, they, they're delicious. You know, mm. in Monterrey and Saltillo, mm. is, he's also a well-known chef. Uh, you have seen, obviously, the series from Netflix, uh, which uh, Ricardo is participating in. Yeah, that, of course, of course. Chefs. And then no, you're, you're not talking about Memo Gonzalez. You're talking about Memo Gonzalez, you talk about Memo uh, or Guillermo no? Gonzalez Beristan, which is a friend from Montreal. Yeah, yes, of course, Memo. And uh, La Manzana, which we call another chef, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Humberto Villarreal, called of La course, Manzana. Of course. That's his nickname. And he's talking about Machitos as well. Yeah. So yeah. you see that this. Uh, this uh, chapter, you know, mm -hmm. they explain you all the details about machitos there oh, that are it. made in Saltillo and Monterey. Yeah. We have family. We have family in Saltillo. Do we? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Didn't um, didn't the Marina and them live in? No, they live in Calvillo. Calvillo. I'm sorry, not Saltillo. Par but pardon me. It rhymes. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca, helping you to plan your next getaway. Ithaca has waterfalls and wineries, art and theater, outdoor recreation, and family fun. The area is famous for its glacier-carved gorges, co-op-run businesses, and cultural influences from Cornell University and Ithaca College. Plus, you can't beat the beauty of Cayuga Lake, the largest of the Finger Lakes. Beyond 150 waterfalls and some of the region's best hiking trails, Ithaca is cider. The area is well known for its local cideries, which are leading the way in America's cider revival. You can hear from the region's cider makers directly on HRN series Hardcore. There's something really special about Ithaca's climate for cultivating delicious apples steeped in history and terroir. Let Visit Ithaca help you plan your next trip to this hub of food, drink, culture, and agritourism. Home of New York's craft cider, I love New York. Get started at visitithaca.com. I think one of the things that is important to mention is, Mauricio, where can people get more information about Mexican cuts and Mexican beef how can they bring it to their restaurants? How can they support it? What are some of the things that we can let, uh, share with people? Well, I, I, I would be able to provide, you know, links which people can download information, you know, about the beef cuts. And uh, I, I don't know if you are able to share my, my email. Of Absolutely. Or, or, or even uh, my phone. If somebody has any question, I can provide information. And yeah. do you have a, where, do you have where a they website? be able to download? Because we have different different sites, you know. But if you are looking for a special topic, I will be telling them. I will be able to tell them, you know, where to get that info. Yeah, Mauricio, just use your your email, your website. Don't give your phone number. We have a lot of creepy fans. Okay, okay. we have okay. fans that will do anything. Okay, protect yourself. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> un guapote así como tú, un cuerazo, brother. Te, te, van a, te van a seguir. Este, um, so, yeah, we can, so we'll make sure that you share your email, right, and your website, Mauricio, so people can get more information about how to support Mexican beef and, and all of the, the beautiful things that come with it. And then you can educate them as well, maybe give some links to all the chef friends that yeah. we have in common. Yeah. And all the and all the different dishes that you can only make with those cuts. Mm. You know, one 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 other thing that I would like to mention is uh, I've been talking with different people from uh, who has been in the government, for example, from Chihuahua, because I was born in Chihuahua. Actually, mm. I'm from Parral, the south the south part of Chihuahua, and I think is a lot of things that we need to to invest. You know, in Mexico, one is. To, to have a um, uh, marbling uh, quality assurement uh, standards in Mexico. And uh, we could start with Chihuahua and Sonora, which are the mainly European breeds. 
to to start a quality assurement. Some uh, of the ranches in Mexico they do this kind of assurement because they export like cattle to the states, mm. so they regularly those those. But the thing is, uh, we need to to invest, you know, in education, and, and the government needs to invest as well, you know, to to make this assurement. And uh, I think most of the chefs, like Ricardo and some others, they will be pretty interested on on support those ideas. So oh, hopefully, in the coming years, we could do so, and we could make a huge difference. Uh, on understanding Mexican beef, the way that we use different dishes, different beef cuts, they have like an entire map, you know, on the different mm. areas that produce different kind of uh, beef. And uh, that will be really helpful, not only for, for the students, I would say for the foodies that really travel to try any certain dishes that would be exceptional. To, yeah. to have that information, right? Well, you know, I, I have a big question because in the ranch we used to have the corridas, you know, the, the cattle roundups. And that's where we separated the calves from the mothers. And I remember at night the, the cows, you know, wailing. And and then you took you took the steers to the border and then sold them to, to, to America, to the United States. So, I mean, if they're Mexican... But they're really raised. They're really raised in the United States, aren't they? I mean, how, how does that affect the meat? You know, because because they buy the steers. It, it doesn't affect. You know, I, I think uh, we are in the, in that global world where everybody is able to sell. You know, the the best products anywhere. Yeah. Since we are importing beef from uh, from Japan, for example, we are importing beef from the states, from Canada. They are able to to buy cattle from Mexico or from Canada. So the thing is, we need to make a, a quality assurement, you know, not only with a few ranches in Mexico. So we need to set up like a national quality assurement standards, absolutely. standards, absolutely. standards. Yeah, that we don't have for now. Is there anything like a Wayu beef in Mexico? Yeah. We, we have Wayu in Mexico, just as uh, Canada and the States, but mostly in, uh, we have 100% Wayu and we have the half-breed Wayu Angus, which is also produced in Canada, States, and Mexico. Mm, wonderful. But only a few, a few ranches. So we, yeah. we have that beef as well. Well, Mauricio... I'm going to be down in Cancun for the Food and Wine Festival coming up shortly. So hopefully I can see you there. I know that you're, you're in Merida right now, no? Estás en Merida. Yeah, I'll be, yeah, I'm in Merida. I'll be there uh, from Thursday to Wednesday in Maya Riviera for yeah. a week. So, so hopefully I'll be able to see you there. I'm coming down to Cancun to cook. So hopefully I'll be able to see you there. When, when you're going to be arriving. Oh, man. Well, it's for the festival. Um... I don't even know. Hold on. With David Amar, right? Sí. Sí, mi rey. Okay. Um, but hopefully we have a chance to catch up. And look, I, I want to say we are just beyond. We are blown away. We are so enlightened by all of your information. You're doing such valuable work. I think what you're doing right now to promote Mexican beef, all the cuts, the dishes, as you said, is something that you have. You can corner this market. You can be the face of it. Because we need you, Mauricio. We need you to be able to promote our Thanks, culture Sarah. and our beef. And I, and I think you're doing something so special. So we're very grateful for having you here today. Que honor. Que honor, mi rey. I'm grateful for, for your invitation. And no. I want to, to uh, provide a really uh, thankful, I'm really thankful, you know, because of your invitation and because of Ricardo was talking with me about Sarela, so he was the one that really made this uh, happen at all. So I, I want to thank Ricardo as well, and both of you, of course. Of course. And this yeah. was, hosting me here. And this was not tacos de lengua. Because, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because, you know, we have that, that, uh, no. that saying that says tacos de lengua when somebody's, like, talking too much about putting yeah. on too much cream yeah. in their tacos. Yeah, exactly. Well, That's the same. Tacos this is the best. 
Yesterday I try I try uh, tacos of Castacan. Of course, you know what is Castacan, mm -hmm. right? No, I don't. Castacan is is that we call made with pork, the carnitas, uh -huh. you know, yep. like a, some kind of a chicharrón. Yeah. So it's a really well known dish here in uh, in uh, Merida. Castacan mm -hmm. is made with cerdo pelón, uh -huh. yep. which is the breed. Uh, original breed from uh, Yucatan. So it was, you know, one of the best uh, tacos that I have ever tried. You know, <laughs> you know what we didn't talk about, and I think it's good, we didn't talk about mountain oysters. Yeah, bulls balls. The, te the, the testicles of the steers. We used to yeah, put yeah, yeah, Que toda madre que no hablamos de ellos. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're really good as well. You know? Oh no, they're tasty too. I've had some, but uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of jokes that can be thrown around. But you know yeah, what? Know. It's all good. But it's it's good stuff. The like, bad yeah, jokes, yeah. but the, good yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah hey, anyway, Pero, mil gracias. Mil gracias, mi rey. Muchas gracias. Te mando muchos abrazos, ah, y, y mándale muchos okay, saludos muchos al, abrazos, al, al, al jefe, al jefe Ricardo, por favor, ¿ok? Claro que sí. Gracias, mi rey. Un abrazo. Hasta bien. luego, eh. Hasta, Hasta luego bye. a todos. Gracias. Bye. bye. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simple Cast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without your support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.